My earliest memory of the Swansea Grand Theatre was not long after we'd moved to Swansea from uh, North Wales, where I developed a really early interest in theatre, having gone to the Arcadia Theatre there to see Summer Seasons. And then it was Christmas, and my mother brought me to the Swansea Grand to see a pantomime. Now, to be honest, it wasn't until recently I realised which pantomime it was, but I do remember some significant things about it. In Llandid, no, the Summer Seasons uh, were what were called Catelyn's variety shows. And the dancers there were choreographed by the Cherry Willoughby dancers. And we passed the theatre one day, and even as a young child, I noticed that the name of the dancers in the pantomime were the Cherry Willoughby dancers. But more than that, uh, the dame in the pantomime was an old performer called Tommy Rose. Now, Tommy had uh, moved to Llandidno uh, for a summer season once as the stooge to um, the comedian Ted Rogers. And he stayed in Llandidno for the rest of his career. And then I came to Swansea, and the very first ever pantomime dame I saw was Tommy Rose, who I'd seen in summer season. And looking back on it, that really had an impact on me, that show. We um, sat in the gods, uh, the old theatre then, uh, would have been called the gallery probably on posters, now called the upper circle, but um, it would have been known locally as the gods. So we walked up a long lot of stone stairs and got to the very top of the theatre, and the theatre then had benches, um, cushioned benches, but there wasn't a lot of comfort in them. But it was packed, and uh, in those early days, the theatre, which would have played perhaps eight shows a week for pantomime in those days, uh, was full. And what I noticed differently to the shows I saw in North Wales, it was full of children this time, uh, full of people like me who'd come to see the pantomime. And I recall uh, the scenery quite clearly, um, being very colourful, and really good quality. Swansea, of course, uh, was regarded as a, quite a leading touring theatre in those days for uh, a lot of productions, particularly plays, but the quality of production we had would have come from some of the major theatres in Scotland. And in more recent times, I've discovered they would have been what were known as Howard and Wyndham pantomimes, where we'd have in Swansea their set and their costumes, perhaps having been around a few venues before they came here. But I remember the colour of those. I remember that uh, they had a lot of dancers. Budgets are very different now, and perhaps you might have six dancers in a pantomime. In those days, there would have been 18 Cherry Willoughby dancers, and a band of probably about seven or nine players, a really full live sound. And of course, no radio mics then. Uh, it was reliant on having microphones stationed in about three positions on the stage, and people who would have been from an older tradition um, who would have projected their voices. And the theatre was packed. And that really fostered in me a very early interest in theatre. And uh, one thing I remember specifically about that uh, season was an act that toured variety halls for many years and were particularly known and seen on many pantomime posters called Dumart and Denzar. And their billing was Skeletons Alive. And as a particular feature within the show, uh, there'd uh, be uh, a, an ultraviolet uh, sequence of skeletons that would swing into the audience. And when we think technology in those days would have been relatively primitive, no doubt they were only swinging off lighting bars. Uh, there was nothing suspended over the theatre or anything like that, over the auditorium. And that was quite a standout feature of that. Little was I to know that that early interest in pantomime would have fostered a career in it. I've now directed about 27 of them, and I've done quite a few versions of Dick Whittington, that very first story that I saw at the Grand. When I look back on all the pantomimes I've seen here, there has to be, uh, in my mind, and that's no disrespect to some amazing performers we've had since, but there was a golden period in the 70s when uh, Ryan and Ronnie uh, just stormed the place here. Ryan, of course, did two as part of the double act Ryan and Ronnie, and then did three on his own. When I was about uh, 13, I belonged to a magic uh, group in Swansea called the Swansea Guild of Magicians. And one of the members there was a Swansea character called Don Pelosi. Those um, that would remember the 50s and 60s and 70s in Swansea would remember there was Pelosi's Cafe that was at the back of the Swansea Empire Theatre. And Dom had a real love of theatre, having met so many performers from the Empire and the Grand Theatre that would have gone into his cafe. And Dom and his wife... Uh, invited the magicians to their house in uh, Glanmore for afternoon tea one Sunday. And being the youngest member of the group, I wouldn't have expected to be invited. But Dom sent me a message to say, of course, you'd, if you'd like to come, you're welcome to come. And the reason they had afternoon tea there was he'd invited a magician called Des King, who was playing buttons in the Swansea pantomime. Now, I'd seen the pantomime and had seen the work of Des King, 
and was interested in magic. So for me, it was quite a big thing to meet a star of the Swansea pantomime. And during the afternoon, we learned about his career and he could see my interest and asked whether I'd ever been backstage in the Grand. And he said, if you want to come backstage, I'll give you a tour. Uh, why don't you come one Saturday while uh, the show is on? And of course, in those days, Pantomime in Swansea would open on Boxing Day and run through into the middle of March. So there was lots of Saturdays to choose. But I went on the very next Saturday and turned up at stage door uh, and asked for Des. And uh, he came to meet me, took me to his dressing room. And um, I came every single Saturday afternoon for the rest of the season. And during that time, I, of course, uh, rubbed shoulders almost literally in the wings with Ryan and Ronnie. They were just mega stars. Anybody that never saw them work, a younger generation, can't begin to believe or recognise the impact they had on the entertainment scene in Wales, known as the Welsh Morecambe and Wise. And their pantomime performances were just remarkable. And so I saw every single uh, performance of a Saturday matinee with Ryan in until the end of the season. Between that year and the following year, when uh, they returned from Cinderella that year to Dick Whittington the following year, Don Pelosi died. And I know that he was quite friendly with Ryan, but as a youngster, just wondered whether he'd heard. And so I came to the theatre one day, when you look back at it quite brave, really, for a 14-year-old, came to stage door and asked if I could see Ryan. The theatre staff remembered me from the previous year and took me to Ryan and Ronnie's dressing room. And I said that... Uh, had he heard that Dom had died he hadn't and he said I'm really glad that you came to see me and I remember you coming a lot last year if you want to come on a Saturday like you did last year by all means leave your jacket in here and you can watch the show from the wings so I saw again every single Ryan and Ronnie Saturday matinee right the way through to the end of the season and subsequently when the double act finished the then three uh, pantomimes um that Ryan did as a solo performer. And in many ways, I look back perhaps as Mother Goose as being the most spectacular of that, where he was just a remarkable um, Mother Goose, a classic, amazing role for a pantomime dame. And it was when Ryan could show all his skills of comedy and particularly his skills of pathos, because he was obviously a very talented actor, uh, when we had that whole breakdown of Mother Goose, when she realises she's done the wrong thing in selling her soul, really, to become beautiful. So really happy memories. And then I went on to see um, Ryan and Ronnie during those five years um, in many places, in Port Call at the Grand Pavilion in performances and different places. And then tragically, as is known now, having seen the very last performance here uh, in uh, the Grand Theatre of Babes in the Wood, uh, Ryan's last pantomime here, uh, we heard so very soon after that he died on holiday in America and I was absolutely devastated. I was soon to go to drama school and he'd been a massive influence on my not only love of pantomime uh, but that whole idea of um, Welsh performers and the impact they can make on theatre in Wales. He was a legend and many people have tried to follow and we have some amazing Welsh pantomime performers now. And um, many though would regard those Ryan and Ronnie years not only here at the Grand but the qualities he brought to pantomime performances as probably being the best you would have seen on any stage in Britain, let alone in Wales itself. During the late 70s, I made the decision to go to drama school and uh, did a couple of years at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama and then subsequently tra trained as a teacher, which brought me back to Swansea, having been away studying for a while. And uh, as a young drama teacher teaching in the uh, then West Glamorgan Education Authority, I was working on a residential course and somebody I was working with said, um, David, I wonder whether you'd do me a favour, what are you doing in this particular date? And I looked at my diary and I thought perhaps he wanted me to go and do some workshops somewhere. And he said, I'm directing a production of Kiss Me Kate at Swansea Grand Theatre and we're desperate to have um, another character playing one of the suitors. Uh, the other suitor that I ended up being alongside was Anthony Lynn, who's become uh, a very well-known um, director for the Disney Corporation, another Swansea lad. And so I did a week here in Swansea Grand uh, in a production of Kiss Me Kate alongside Anthony. And I remember distinctly walking in the theatre when it was still um, the old backstage areas then. Some developments, I believe, had gone on. Uh, but the backstage area was still where you walked through that stage door that I'd walked in to see uh, Ryan and Ronnie on that first uh, time I ever stepped in the theatre. When you could smell the scenery. And there's a different smell in theatres now, but you walked in in those days and you could smell what I was told was the size that they'd put onto the, uh, the paint to sort of protect it. 
and as the heat came up, so you'd smell this, um, this size, as it was called. And so it was my turn now to not be standing in the wings and watching, but to walk on uh, for about eight performances that week in what was a very good production um, and some very good people in it of um, Kiss Me Kate. Some very strong amateurs in that show um, from an operatic society that doesn't exist now. It was the Gendros, then called Catholic Operatic Society. And then again, the following year, um, the same director, um, he said, you did me a favour last year, what about this year? And it wasn't really my intention to do amateur shows because I had another career I was developing. Uh, but I did take that job because it was Sound of Music. Um, the film that was the first film I saw when we moved to Swansea in the then new Odeon. And uh, I appeared then for that week. And that was, again, a similar level of excitement to be on that side of the stage looking out at that gallery that I'd once seen pantomime from. The best known person in that production, of course, wasn't me, uh, but one of the Von Trapp children was Catherine Zeta-Jones. And uh, she still has very fond memories of her early days working with those societies here at the Grand. In more recent years, it's come full circle, really, where I've brought groups of people to perform here uh, for nine consecutive years. We've had a project at the Grand Theatre called Swansea's Primary Partners, where children from all over the Swansea area uh, come over a series of a week and do performances based on work they've created in school and we present those 15-minute uh, items on the stage here. Songs and musicals, dance work, choirs and it's become quite a highlight in the years of the schools. They plan it ahead where part of their year will be during the summer the children, perhaps in year six or year five, whichever year group, come and perform on the Grand Theatre stage. The stage that's the stage of the children of Swansea, really. And it's brilliant that over 125 years, those opportunities have prevailed. From the days going back, other shows I remember here, of the gang shows, which would have hundreds of uh, scouts and guides taking part. But still, the theatre has a commitment to allowing young people to perform on their stage. And perhaps, again, there'll be a full circle that they, in turn, will bring audience members in and perhaps they'll bring young people to perform on the stage themselves. So yeah, it's always been a very inclusive theatre in terms of access to young people, and that's something from an audience perspective, seeing pantomime, to a young performer as a drama teacher at the same time then, performing myself, and then seeing the excitement of young children coming in for their first tour of the theatre, walking into the stage door, seeing their dressing rooms, coming on and seeing the show being lit. Um, really exciting times and I'm privileged that the Grand has allowed me to develop that type of initiative here in more recent years. Over the years I've lived in Swansea, which is quite a number of years now, um, I've obviously seen quite a lot of change and uh, it was quite an exciting change when we saw this venue, the Grand Theatre, altering into what was a, a very old-fashioned uh, building. The auditorium will never change, it's just so beautiful. Uh, when we've seen it becoming one of the best stages in terms of facilities and size outside of London at one point. And clearly other places have developed in Wales since. But we've got a real jewel in the Grand Theatre here and it's been exciting in recent times with the development of the arena and the very complementary provision that they'll be able to provide opportunities that the Grand wouldn't be able to house. Certain types of events and certain uh, scale of performers perhaps that need a bigger type of platform to work on. It's now an opportunity that the Grand has got and is committed to, to develop a complementary provision that once again can perhaps bring in some of the work that we've enjoyed here. When I look at the early days when I come into the Grand, and you can learn a lot from the past, but not live in the past, um, we'd have Welsh drama here, we'd have opera here, we'd have a range of the operatic societies I mentioned the gang show a little earlier where that community group would be in. We've had old, we'd have older people taking part on the stage as well as the children that I've spoken about and opportunities for them. And my desire for the future here would be that we'll see some of that old coming back where we will see touring plays. We will see some of the mid-scale touring musicals that the arena won't be interested in receiving uh, but we can celebrate here again. Um, some of that programming is exciting to see already in planning for the theatre and I think we could be going through another golden period at the Grand with new management, uh, with new visions based on real experience of running similar venues in the past and together with the Taliesin Art Centre, the city could, with the right people in the right places and the right vision, be a real contender in the art scene in Wales.